So we have invited um, environmental attorney um, Gal, um, Dan Galford uh, as a result of um, Dave, Dave Mullinex here. So thank you very much. And I believe that was 354. Okay, and so in addition to 350.org, we have a presentation by the Green New Deal Committee, which is a joint committee of the Environmental Caucus and the Labor Caucus of the Democratic Party of Hawaii. My name is Dave Alex, I'm with 350 Hawaii, and um, we have a climate emergency declaration that we're trying to put through the legislature. It's actually a resolution, and uh, so the resolutions will come later on in the year, uh, like around March, I think. But um, we need to get as many signatures on our petition as we can. Right now we have about 1,200. And uh, so the more signatures we have, the more pressure we put on our legislators. Uh, as Dan would tell you, and anyone else who's been dealing with climate change for a while, politicians are moving at a snail's pace. Inertia is kind of the, you know, the way they move. And, uh, but Climate change is not moving at inertia. It's moving very quickly. It's moving a lot quicker than even the scientists have been predicting. Uh, the, uh, we're just seeing Australia, you know, burning to the ground right now at uh, 120 degrees. You know, and if folks don't have um, air conditioning, people are going to die. That's not just happening in Australia. It's going to be happening here someday as our trade winds uh, disappear. So it's going to have a major impact on us here locally. Uh, someone just telling me on the North Shore, the house near there, there is, is lost 20 feet in front from the ocean, taking it away. Uh, oh, I lost my... Oh, you must have stepped on it. Maybe I stepped on it. Try it. stepped in it. Okay, there you go. <laughs> um, the, no, the war in Syria is because of the of, uh, climate... Um, uh, drought. That's why that war started. There's going to be a lot of wars starting because of drought. The climate emergency, the emergency we have on our southern border, all refugees, they're fleeing a climate drought. You know, um, the Iceland uh, ice sheet was supposed, predicted to uh, melt about 2070. It's already melted 50 years ahead of schedule. And the folks in the South Pacific are already planning for their immediate evacuation of their tradition. They've been here for thousands of years. Once they leave there, their culture will be incredibly impacted. So we are already in an emergency. Our legislature is not acting like that. We had 130 bills last year that could have made a difference about climate change, and virtually none of them passed. We got a very few passed. So we need to motivate our legislators. We need to get people more involved, and that's what we do at 350. And so we do have a website. Oh yeah. Is that? See if you can put that on your shirt. Well, why don't we just, it's, um, yeah, it's bit.ly. Oh, it's backwards. Ah. <laughs> it's uh, it's, it's bit.ly forward slash for climate all caps. So go there and sign the petition, please. We're, we, uh, we're looking for other organizations to join us. So it's 350 right now, our revolution, Hawaii, and the Polynesian Cultural Society, I mean the Polynesian Society. Those, they went around the world. They saw the direct effects around the world and so they've joined us and so we're asking other organizations to join as well so please you know sign up uh, and join us in um, sending this petition to get the governor to declare a climate emergency thank you very much thank you thank you Dave okay I'm just waiting I'm getting a text from Jeff and any other signer he is indicating that uh, they're having a hard time hearing. Let me see if they can hear me. Oh. Everybody, please sign in. Oh, you can hear me now. <laughs> Couldn't could hear you, but can hear me now. Okay. All right. Let me just put this down a moment. Hold that a moment so I can give our guest speaker. Okay. Back to Eugene, Oregon. Thank you. Thank you for coming. He doesn't know Hawaiian style. He's supposed to. There we go. There we go. <laughs> okay, so let me just give you an introduction. Sure. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Yes. Yeah.
Okay, so our guest speaker is Dan Galperin. He's an environmental attorney for the last 15 years. Seven years he was with Dr. James Hansen. Dr. James Hansen is known as the father of climate change awareness. He's a former director of NASA's Goddard, say the right Goddard. 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 Thank you. Goddard Institute of Space Studies for 32 years. And a director, currently the director, is that correct? Currently the director of climate science at OK, Climate Science Awareness Solutions Program at Columbia University Earth Institute. Now, one of the things they've been arguing is that in, at the UN climate conferences, there's, they have long ignored the role of fossil fuel when it comes to the climate crisis. Lawsuits have been filed against fossil fuel industries for damages to compensate for the infrastructure and the having to rebuild. However, at this point, no no highly vulnerable nation has attempted to hold the carbon industry liable for damages. Major industrialized nations maintain high fossil fuel consumption and high emissions, and they're making their role and masking, I'm sorry, masking their role in the climate crisis. I googled it today and it indicated that on August 2019, 3,383 barrels per day from the U.S. is being exported. What does that mean? One barrel comes out to 42 gallons, so that comes out to 142 gallons 142,000 gallons per day of oil is exported from the United States. And that's um, data from the U.S. Energy and Information. So Dan Galpern has assisted Dr. Hansen in state and federal climate-related matters in several states. California, Illinois, Massachusetts, Minnesota, Montana, North Dakota, Texas, Washington, Oklahoma, and several nations. And those include Colombia, Great Britain, Netherlands, Philippines, and New Zealand. These legal efforts are used to take the climate emergency head on, including efforts to stop fossil fuel expansion and to preserve forests as important carbon sinks. Dan Galpern has also authored two law review articles. The first one, Atmospheric Recovery Litigation, Making Fossil Fuel Industry Pay to Restore a Viable Climate System. <coughs> Journal of Environmental Law 2016. And he also wrote Climate Change 101, Urgency and Response. Journal of Environmental Law and Litigation 2008. Dan is from Eugene, Oregon, and is a staff attorney with the Western Environmental Law Center. 100% of his practice is concentrated in environmental and natural resources law. At this time, I'd like to give Dan the floor. We're all been waiting. This is wonderful, and several of us are attorneys here, so I'm sure we're all interested in how we can stop climate change by Stop. You want to say a few things? Yeah, you do. Oh, okay. There we go. Yeah, we want to stop. I mean, that's the big thing. We want to stop the fossil fuel industry. So, do you, you want me to sit here or, and use this computer? Yes. Is that right? I believe that's right, and then we should be able to okay. screenshot. So, can I get some technical assistance about how to use this well, he's getting technical assistance. I want to say something. Okay, we sure. We have some special guests here that I think we all need to give a huge round of applause. We have Dr. Chip Fletcher in the audience. <laughs> you know, they're doing the hard work. They're providing the science. They're telling us what we need to do. Now all we have to do is act. They've already done all the hard work, so now we just have to listen. And so if we could do better than that, how about a louder round of applause? Thank you so much. And we, we also have uh, Kavika Pigram uh, in the audience, uh, one of the leaders uh, from our youth climate strike. Let's have a huge round of applause. <laughs> I'm 
so proud of our youth for standing up and doing what they're doing to to uh, get us to act. But we shouldn't we shouldn't be putting the climate crisis burden on their shoulders of 14 year olds and 15 year olds and 16 year olds. The adults made this mess. We need to clean this up. And so. Thank you to the youth movement for what you're doing to get us to do what we need to do. But we need to act. We should not be putting this on their shoulders. This climate crisis was created by us, not them. And so we all need to stand up for that. And if you're in this room, that means you know that. But we need to get the word out there that that um, our elected officials who have an opportunity to to make policy can do something about it. And we need to remind them with the LOHA, but we need to demand with the LOHA that, that uh, we have climate action and we have a quick Please, again, if you're at this meeting, that means you get it and that, that you, you know that there's a crisis and that we need to do something. And so what we're asking you to do is tell your, your, your family, your friends, everybody you know, and have them tell 10 other people that this is the year, this is 2020, and this is the year that greenhouse gas emissions need to drop like a stone. And so that message needs to get to everybody who is a policymaker. This is the year that, that we are going to do it because we want to make sure that our, our, our future is a safe future for our, our children and for their children. And so through the green the green new deal we have a, we have a vehicle to do this and so i'm just so excited about the legislation so that's going to be happening in the let uh, please stay tuned we, we're going to need a lot of testimony we're going to need to show up we need to let them know we're serious about this and the green new deal is, is a great vehicle to have this happen okay ready okay thanks everybody yeah <laughs> Did everybody sign in? Thank you. Did you? Yes, I did. Hey, you should explain to everybody in this room where the 350 comes from. Yeah. Because that's a really important number. That, that's, that's a level of... Uh, you should tell the whole... I know, but tell them. <laughs> well, we can all we can so make it come down. Million is where we wish we would have stayed at or below, but we exceeded it quite a while ago. It's just so you know where the sweat is. I'll add on to the answer to that last question. Um, Dr. Hansen um, came to the climate talks and did one of the programs with me in Davis last time, and he said that Bill McGibbon approached him some years back, saying he wanted to start an organization called 450.org, and um, 450 being the parts per million, and Hansen told him, no, 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 way, way, way too much, so three bats were decided that 350 was the maximum, and if somebody's not too well, Okay, uh, thanks very much to Dave and Sherry and Democratic Party and friends that I knew before I came here and new friends. Um, the uh, level of commitment and engagement in this room is incredible. Those are my glasses. You can try them. <laughs> 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 uh, and uh, I need a new pair. Yeah, yeah. So it's uh, it's just amazing to be here. Uh, <clears throat> Justice Brennan, a great jurist from the United States observed once that it, it is the enforcement of law that really matters. Yes. And there is some truth to that, although it's important to ensure that one has adequate law to enforce. Um, I've been working, uh, as was indicated, as an environmental lawyer over the last 15 years and, and uh, over the last seven years with the climate scientist, uh, Dr. Hansen. I should correct one thing that you noted. I used to work for the Western Environmental Law Center, but I've been an independent uh, attorney for a number of years now. Oh, okay. Uh, although it's, it's all on the website. That's right. It's, it's all 
it's still there. In the, in the, um, and so in these efforts, we, we do attempt to take the climate crisis head on, uh, including to stop, enor uh, to stop enormous unconventional fossil fuel uh, expansion projects, uh, like uh, exploitation of tar sands in, in, uh, in Alberta, uh, trying to stop the trans mountain expansion in Canada, uh, engaged in the effort to stop the Keystone XL uh, pipeline uh, that uh, that was in, in the Ninth Circuit a number of months ago, and then Trump uh, took back the State Department permit and issued his own presidential permit. It was actually a smart move, I mean, you know, on their side. Um, and it had the effect of looting the case, and so we had to, starting square one now in Montana Federal Court, um, we're presently in. I'm not there right now, but we are engaged in the effort before the Illinois Public Utilities Commission uh, to stop the expansion of the Dakota Access uh, Pipeline. So we're doing a number of things um, around the country, around the world. We can't hear you back here. Can you use the mic? Ah, sorry. Okay, I thought I was using it. All right. Now, the question is, how do I advance? I want to. This is fairly sensitive. Um, I'm going to do a little uh, science, even though Chip Fletcher is right in front of me. <laughs> so it's a bit hazardous. But, uh, you know, after working for about 20 years as a public policy analyst, I, uh, with my wife's permission, decided to go to law school to see if I could do something uh, about the environmental crisis. Uh, and so I thought, you know, how best to train my mind so I can get a reasonable score in the LSAT and be able to handle the, uh, the bigger of, uh, of law school. So I, well, I like math and science, so I'll go back and I'll relearn all, all my math. And, and so I did, I started from, you know, these textbooks and I, Worked my way all the way to calculus and then three semesters, including statistics with calculus. So somehow I got in. The first day they had an orientation, and the uh, law professor gets up there and he says, Well, like many of you, uh, I'm here because I wanted to go into the law because I couldn't do math. <laughs> so, uh, so that was something. But um, you need to do math if you're going to uh, not, you know, not, not, not high math, but you need to be able to handle math if you're going to try to understand climate science and other science. Um, so here uh, is a depiction from uh, NASA, according to analysis by them, approximately 340 watts per square meter of solar energy falls on the Earth as measured at the top of the atmosphere. About 29% of that's reflected back to space, uh, primarily by clouds, but also by other bright surfaces and, uh, and the atmosphere itself. About 23% of incoming energy is absorbed in the atmosphere by atmospheric gases, dust, and other particles. And the remaining 48% is, is, is absorbed at the surface. The Earth's surface then transfers its 48% of the total budget back to the atmosphere via evaporation, convection, and thermal radiation. Now that thermal radiation, about 12%, makes it all the way back to space, leaving about 5 percentage points to be absorbed in the atmosphere. Our planet is in peril due to a rising, by the way, am I audible back then? Not now. I beg your pardon. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'll try to Sorry, so people are suffering about that. They can't hear me. Or maybe they're as by that. Thank you. All right. Just, that, wow. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Hey, 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 h
I'm not going back. <laughs> <laughs> Our uh, planet here at Echo is in peril due to a uh, rising energy imbalance. That is clearly established in the record even before uh, 1950 and, and anticipated much, much earlier. I show this slide. This was produced and updated by Dr. Hansen and his team at Climate Science Awareness Solution in uh, October of 2018. The positive climbing forcing, uh, climate forcing effect of greenhouse gas pollution overwhelms the cooling effect of aerosols, uh, as you can see here. So that the net effect, which is shown on the right, is the heating up of the planet, uh, particularly uh, since 1950. This is so sensitive. Maybe I can use arrows. Better. This chart, also from Hansen's group, shows the increase in fossil fuel emissions since the turn of the prior century. Again, it's been uh, inexorable and steep uh, since roughly about 1950, as you can see on the right. Coal emissions remain at near record levels, which may surprise uh, people while emissions from oil approach those in co of coal uh, in recent decades. <clears throat> carbon emissions are received in the atmosphere and taken up by carbon sinks on land and in the ocean, as is shown by this graphic. Uh, this is part of a recent report uh, that was released uh, during COP25 when I was over in Madrid early in December. There are limits the amount of CO2 that's rapidly taken up in the land and ocean. Uh, and the balance remains in the atmosphere, as you can see at the bottom. Though there's an exchange between the land, ocean, and atmosphere of reservoirs. Um, the, atmosphere, the excess in the atmosphere heats our planet, and the excess in, in the ocean changes its pH and uh, compromises uh, the food chain. The problem is only getting worse as additional CO2 accumulates. So we're now in a climate crisis. Well, this is not good. Everybody stand on your head. Yes, bend your head to the right. Because Chip took up so much of my time this afternoon. <laughs> We may all have to turn our heads, <laughs> but uh, I include this on the next slide as the same problem. Turn it down. Turn it down. So we're having we're having technical difficulties uh, somehow in the transfer to this to this machine. A lot of slides turn sideways, uh, so I'll just talk you through it. Um, so that you don't really have to turn your head, but if you want to, turn your head to the left. <clears throat> About 45 degrees would do it. 90 would be preferable. <laughs> <clears throat> the, the problem is exacerbated by the behavior of uh, atmospheric CO2. <clears throat> so for any burst of emissions that goes into the atmosphere, approximately 50% will remain for centuries uh, now uh, in the atmosphere. And it's for this reason that um, uh, quickly phasing out emissions is not enough, as I'll discuss later. We need actually at this point to draw down excess atmospheric CO2 into Earth's system out of the atmosphere where it's doing its most damage, although to the degree to which it's drawn into the ocean we have the problem, the, the small problem of ocean acidification. <clears throat> uh, this slide purportedly shows that at present, China is emitting the most uh, CO2 equivalent emissions, with the United States emitting approximately 50% of China's quantity. But uh, in terms of cumulative emissions, which is what matters, uh, the United States has emitted approximately a fourth of all uh, international uh, emissions uh, since um, the Industrial Age commenced. 
Uh, this uh, slide is uh, inscrutable, but I'll tell you what it's supposed to say. <laughs> and that is that uh, on a per capita basis, uh, the United States is, uh, those of us in the United States emit uh, more uh, CO2 emissions, uh, or, or, uh, cause more CO2 emissions than any other industrialized country. Uh, and much more than China. In fact, more on a per capita basis than Great Britain. <clears throat> so, as I say, this has caused a climate crisis, and one of the signal problems here is that it, we are heating up the oceans and um, uh, causing thermal expansion of the oceans. And we are also uh, melting a significant portion or increasingly significant portions of the cryosphere are ice and snow, including um, the major ice sheets and, uh, of course, glaciers and so on. And that is leading to uh, significant um, and rising sea levels. And for some nations, this is an, an immediate or virtually an immediate present crisis. Um, this shows. And, and, and those countries really cannot wait any longer for real climate action. Uh, now, my office has produced high sea level scenario fact sheets uh, with these types of, of maps for all uh, 44 uh, association of small island state uh, states members, as well as a number of other vulnerable states. Um, prior estimates relied on satellite based measurements. And they estimated, uh, that estimated elevation from the tops of structures such as buildings or from the tops of trees and thus had the effect of minimizing the projected impacts of, for example, dis the risk of displacement uh, because of continued um, sea level rise. Here is the Republic of the Marshall Islands, virtually entirely submerged by the year 2100 the event of continued high emissions and a high impact scenario. A substantial part, for example, of the populated coast of the Solomon Islands also would be submerged with people displaced under the high, under the high sea level scenario. Same, true is, uh, same is true with the Pacific island nation of Vanuatu. Uh, the new database on which we rely is, uh, is from Climate Central, I should add. And it estimates that nearly 16% of the population here would be displaced by the year 2100. Not as horrendous as for the Republic of the Marshall Islands, for example, but more than severe enough. Here's uh, uh, Caribis, uh, spelled Caribati, Caribis. In the event that we don't get serious, it could be gone by the year 2100. Same for the Maldives. Uh, red is. Uh, uh, submerged um, uh, up to 240,000 residents or 96% of the population would face displacement uh, by the year 2100. Now, of course, uh, there is something that could be done. They could, they could build up their islands, they could create new islands, and in fact, I've come to learn recently that is happening. <clears throat> but still, it's not the same. The same people are uh, going to be displaced at least having to move from one place to another, and a great deal of resources are expended uh, in trying to resolve this problem. And for some island nations, they haven't even begun to address it uh, in that sort of way. Uh, it's, of course, not only island nations that confront this sort of untoward risk of sea level rise. Here's Nicaragua, where up to 70,000 residents would face displacement in, uh, by the year 2100 under the high emissions scenario. For Costa Rica, up to 140,000 residents would face displacement um, and under that scenario by the year 2100. But of course, it's not only uh, nations, but states. Here is Honolulu um, using the same tool, looking at the risk of inundation in Honolulu by the year 2100 at the 95th percentile outcome of bottled runs. Uh, this accounts for 10 year flood height on top of a uh, presumed median global sea level of. Uh, 2.4 meters. Now, is this likely to happen to this degree of severity within 80 years? Well, I'm not sure, but 
The five in 100 chance is not nothing and with continued emissions. The question then gets transformed from one of if this is going to happen to when. So, uh, I'm going to skip over a discussion and we can return to it if people are interested of uh, what is happening at the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Um, I was recently there along with my colleague here um, to my left, Stuart Scott. Uh, James Hansen went as well. Um, I would say probably uh, our role there was to try to um, induce higher ambition by the major emitting uh, nations. And that also was the role of the General Secretary to the United Nations, who repeatedly there urged the high emitting nations to redouble their ambitions and actually to honor their commitments that they've made to date. Um, but unfortunately, uh, to no uh, avail, as Stuart likes to say, once again, they kicked the can down the road. Yeah, one of the problems. Uh, embarrassingly for us Americans there in Madrid is the United States. Um, the prior administration uh, did uh, commence uh, some regulatory efforts that uh, would have made a small difference, not nearly enough, but uh, still uh, in the proper direction. Under Trump, everything has been Pretty much everything has been reversed, and uh, those policies that still uh, remain a law are not being uh, implemented with any degree of seriousness, like, for example, the Clean Power Plan. <clears throat> but with a new president, uh, we could do a number of things. And it seems to me that we have a significant opportunity to. Um, replace our highly impeached president with someone who is reasonable. Um, a new president could, for example, reaffirm our nation's commitment to the Paris Agreement. Now we're still in, by the way, because negotiators uh, realized in, in, uh, in 2015 uh, and, uh, saw to it that uh, the period of commitment would extend just into the period of the inauguration of a new president in uh, late 2020. Um, pursuant to that renewed commitment, uh, the United States could pursue deep decarbonization across the board. And it's important to know, even if we retain a hostile, uh, that is to say, a Republican-dominated United States Senate, hostile to reasonable restrictions on the atmospheric, uh, on, on, on greenhouse gas emissions. It's important to know that the president would retain ample authority, um, including authority that President Obama did not even utilize. Uh, so, uh, for example, uh, under Section 115 of the Clean Air Act, um, the administration could require states to restrict emissions that potentially impact other nations, uh, so long as the other nations uh, provide the United States with some degree of re reciprocity. And the Paris Agreement, if retained, would provide that level of reciprocity. The new president, on her own or his own, um, or in response to a petition, could define CO2 as a toxic, toxic substance, and so that the pollutant could be limited and cleaned up pursuant to all the authorities that would then thereby be invoked and uh, capable of being exercised by the administrator to uh, EPA. Uh, to date, that once uh, entirely, uh, once a very promising statute, the Toxic Substances Control Act has been honored in the breach, but we could use it. Uh, either uh, the president could use it either directly or perhaps respond to a new petition, a petition that we will be offering up on behalf of one of your brilliant new Oahu uh, 
scientists and residents and atmospheric chemists, the newlywed uh, Don Vivani. Vivani uh, is right here. And that's the right. Making sure that I pronounce the statue correctly. You didn't pronounce my name correctly. <laughs> uh, Viviani. All right. Um, a study from Columbia University's uh, Sabin Center on Climate Change provides uh, up to a thousand recommendations, uh, many of which can be undertaken under existing law uh, as a blueprint uh, for the next president, if the next president is rational. <coughs> well, what about Hawaii? Um, so that was the question. Yeah. Oh, sure. Oh, sorry. Is that right? Surprisingly, was a question that several legislators asked me last week. What should we do in Hawaii? And I was a little bit surprised, and frankly, I tried to demur on that question for the simple reason that I'm not um, yet sufficiently expert on Hawaii uh, statutes and uh, initiatives to date. I mean, when pressed, I did offer a few ideas, and I'd be happy to get into them here in the question. An answer if anyone really wants, but I doubt it. Um, but in one area, especially uh, with respect to two Hawaii counties, um, substantial leadership is uh, being exercised. Uh, and that is to say that the um, counties of Maui and, and the county of uh, the city and county of Honolulu have announced that they're going to sue the carbon majors for climate-related damages that, yeah, that are now being inflicted um, on, uh, on, the, um, on the populace and, and on the land and with respect to your infrastructure. But I, I regret to say that, uh, however, not every uh, damn uh, Malahani shares my reluctance, my reticence to tell Hawaiians what to do. Malahini. Malahini. Not every damn Malahini. <laughs> I just learned that word. I'm trying. Thank you, Sherry. <laughs> this was three weeks ago in your local uh, paper of record. Um, an article by Christopher Apple. Um, I pulled out a few juicy quotes. Um, he, he, it's titled, Climate Change Lawsuits Bad for Environment, Hawaii Res and Hawaii Residents. And he says, he asserts, that the litigation proposes to scapegoat the energy industry, poor energy industry, <laughs> for making products that are essential to modern life, and for which we all, including people on Maui and Hawaii, continue to demand and use in, in spite of the risks. <clears throat> and this, by the way, is interesting because the complaint has yet to be filed. But still, he knows that it proposes to scapegoat the energy industry for making products that are essential to modern life. Um, he goes on, alternatives like nuclear, wind, and solar also come with risks and controversy. Even local wind farms have generated protests in Hawaii. Many renewables, including wind farms and solar arrays, rely on fossil fuels for their own production. Well, let's say a couple things about this first. Um, as far as I understand, the litigation does not propose to scapegoat the energy industry for making products that are essential to modern life. Uh, it, the litigation, as I understand it, is proposed to hold the fossil fuel industry accountable for their proportionate share of the damages that are being inflicted on the state. And, that is, and that, that's a difference. Um, that's an important difference. Now, um, the, the litigation, as I understand it, is going to uh, be similar to uh, some cases that are also that have already been filed 
on behalf of the cities and counties of San Francisco and Oakland uh, and Marin County and Contra Costa County um, and Imperial Beach and Santa Cruz County in California. And also on behalf of the uh, city of Baltimore, the state of Rhode Island um, and others. And it is not merely uh, because they're creating a product that is being uh, used, but because they have bent our politics in such a way that they have ensured that there's no meaningful restrictions on fossil fuel emissions, and thus no meaningful restrictions on the use of these uh, fuels as intended, and that they have further placed uh, these fuels into the international marketplace, and at the same time that they have they have launched a campaign of deception and misinformation about the likely impacts um, to society. Uh, another interesting point, however, is that the author is identified as an attorney uh, for a law firm in D.C. and counsel, whoops, you can't see it here. Sorry. Well, the bottom got caught, cut off, but counsel to the national Association of Manufacturers. Now, who is the National Association of Manufacturers? Would it surprise you to know that the National Association of Manufacturers includes British Petroleum, ConocoPhillips, ExxonMobil, Shell, Chevron, <laughs> that is, the likely defendants in this lawsuit? That's a fairly important information. Funny that was left out. <laughs> No, perhaps you should have also noted that there was a uh, decisive vote by ExxonMobil shareholders in favor of a resolution in 2017 that called on the company to re report annually on what climate change policies that are set by governments and, and technological advances in the marketplace are designed to keep uh, global warming below 2 degrees uh, Celsius would have uh, on the company. Uh, and that uh, the National Association of Manufacturers now has led the effort, successful because the, the uh, uh, SEC just announced the rule, to restrict the ability of such shareholder uh, petitions and resolutions. So uh, these are interesting <coughs> facts that for some reason didn't make it into the uh, article. The SEC. <coughs> well, People have been uh, taking action. I mentioned what Maui and uh, Oahu are, are set to do. Uh, other actions have occurred around uh, the world. Perhaps the most significant one to date, legal challenge, was by the um, Dutch group, uh, or Agenda. Uh, and a, uh, it's a citizens group, and they challenged the adequacy of that government's planned climate action under the Constitution and under the European Convention on Human Rights on general tort principles, uh, the duty of care. And they won in the lower court, and they won in the Court of Appeals, and uh, two and a half weeks ago, they won before the Dutch Supreme Court. And the Dutch Supreme Court um, announced in, a, in an opinion that has not yet been translated into English, but I received a machine learning uh, you know, translation. <laughs> um, and it's, it's fairly, I, was just, I, I can read it. Uh, and the important point here is that they indicated that the issue of dangerous climate change is one of, um, it touches on fundamental human rights. A very important decision. Uh, a similar effort by Plan B uh, in the United Kingdom resulted in a technical feat in court. Uh, last year, but a, a very galvanized public, which then get, which then pressed Parliament to declare a climate emergency, similar to what you're trying to do here before the state legislature, uh, Dave. <clears throat> it was noted that uh, on behalf of Hanson, we inter intervened in a case in Colombia. Um, Colombia's uh, Greenhouse gas emissions derive in part from, in large part, from the destruction of the Colombia uh, portion of the um, 
Amazon rainforest. And the, the case was brought by the citizens group De Justicia there. Um, it challenged the government to protect the Amazon rainforest as a key component of its Paris obligations. Uh, we, uh, we filed an amicus brief there, um, and the case found in favor of the uh, De Justicia, the citizens group. Um, and the struggle in Colombia and elsewhere for additional Amazon uh, rainforest protections continues, but that case stands for the proposition that, um, at least in Colombia, the government is obliged to honor its uh, declared uh, national contributions, even though they were voluntarily submitted to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. In Germany, a, uh, a Peruvian farmer brought a case in a very bold move against RWE, which is the largest fossil fuel company in that country, saying that uh, climate change is damaging his, uh, his ri is imposing undue risks to his village. There's a, there's a, uh, a lake above his village that's fed by snowmelt, and that snowmelt is accelerating, and there is a, he is concerned that the dam will fail, fail and his village will be um, flooded, and lives and property will be uh, lost. Um, he uh, won a, a preliminary victory in the lower court, and the case is on, on appeal. This is by a single individual uh, bringing the case in Germany. <clears throat> In the Netherlands, the citizens group, the uh, Milieu Defensi, has demanded that the uh, oil giant uh, of that nation, Royal Dutch Shell, transition into an energy company and phase out its uh, fossil fuel operations and investments so as not to undermine the, um, the universal obligations that are generated by the Paris Agreement. Uh, it was just uh, two months ago that Shell responded to the to the complaint, saying, as I understand it, you know, the English translation is still not yet available, but that it has no direct duty or obligation under the uh, Paris Accord. That is to say that its, its obligations only are to state that is federal law in, um, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, and uh, it has no direct duties as a corporation under the uh, Paris Accord. So uh, we'll see where that goes. I indicated already that a series of cases, uh, climate damages cases against the carbon agents have been filed in US cities, counties, and in one, in one state. Uh, they're seeking compensation for past damages and to fortify against anticipated damages. <clears throat> but compensatory damages um, are important exceptionally important that we get a liability judgment against the carbon majors. Uh, but in fact, they do not direct, directly address the underlying problem. They will be very helpful. Um, I mean, the question is, who should pay for these damages? Should it be the residents? Should it be the beleaguered counties and states? And, um, or should the those who have profited most from their ability to utilize the atmosphere as an open sewer, should they be forced to uh, pay for some of the damages? But still, that type of compensatory damages uh, don't directly address the problem. Uh, the problem needs to be addressed uh, first by compelling uh, all jurisdictions and companies to phase out uh, all emissions, and that means, in effect, to phase out utilization of fossil fuels and to draw down excess CO2, because at this point we've gone so too far. <laughs> uh, with, along with a colleague, I wrote an article. It's available on the web, and if you want to get in touch with me, I can get it to you if, if you can't find it. It's on the web. Yeah. Called Atmospheric Recovery Litigation, Making the Cost of Energy to Pay to Restore a Viable uh, Climate System. Uh, in, in my view, there's every reason that uh, impacted uh, 
nations and states should take such action now. Um, I think certain principles need to be made uh, clear. Uh, first, the vulnerable nations merely to confine their obligations to those which are their they're obliged to undertake under Paris is potentially to consign their nation to misery. So, for example, take uh, take New Zealand. It's committed to expending its own efforts at decarbonization to achieve earlier compliance than what it's uh, what it's obliged to do under the Paris Agreement. So good for New Zealand, but their laudable effort, as far as I understand it, will be of little solace to the over 400,000 residents who face displacement by 2100. Uh, utilizing the same mapping, if the world emission levels stay high and there remains little concerted effort to draw down excess atmospheric CO2. Uh, now, some people have raised uh, issues with the notion that, uh, with even talking about uh, atmospheric drawdown of uh, drawdown of excess atmospheric CO2. And so I and others have been advised not to talk too much about so-called negative emissions. Uh, the, the concern is that the uh, international scientific community through the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has relied too heavily on the prospect for substantial negative emissions. And the technologies for drawing down uh, significant atmospheric CO2, except for so-called natural carbon drawdown through reforestation or ag agricultural improvements. But beyond that, there's a concern that the technological uh, means for significant, for example, air capture of CO2 is not available, and so we shouldn't pretend that it is. And of course, that's legitimate. There's no question about it. But um, even under the most Stringent carbon, uh, stringent fossil fuel phase out scenarios that are conceived. And they, they have run hundreds of models through the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, looking at this. Almost all of them depend heavily on carbon drawdown because it is just deemed to be uh, so unlikely as to be virtually impossible that we can do this only through phasing out emissions. It takes time to retool industries. It takes time to uh, transition to uh, non-fossil uh, sources of uh, energy. So what's the resolution? I mean, we need both. Uh, and yet, we don't want to over-rely on the prospect that may not fully materialize of negative, negative emissions. Well. And I think this is my one insight of the evening, so pay attention or you might miss it. <laughs> and that is that we need to impose liability on the major industrial uh, you know, fossil fuel producers that they are responsible for drawing down the excess atmospheric CO2, that they are legally liable to do that. And when you impose that liability, then you create an, an enormous incentive to phase out fossil fuel emissions. Why? Because if they do not phase out those fossil fuel emissions, then their liability grows and grows and grows. And so this is the way I reconcile and conceive of how to reconcile this real problem. Uh, the problem goes away if the question is not really uh, how do we voluntarily uh, do this, uh, have people through their governments pay for this, but rather impose the liability on uh, those who have most profited uh, from the ability to uh, freely emit emissions into the atmosphere and who have uh, created in large part this problem. Well, uh, some of you know that know me that in order to make this uh, trip affordable, because um, you know we're at high time right now, and, and the hotel rooms were out of sight, uh, and also because I you know came here without the family, and so roughing it would not you know I would not pay for it you know in uh, 
I wouldn't hear from I hear from the kids in the way uh, if I took them camping. So I camped on the North Shore, and um, and so every morning I would uh, of this week I would walk along the shore that remains, um, and uh, I don't actually know if this is the North Shore of the but in any event, it's a nice picture. Um, and, and and in fact, the North Shore, you know, as you, you know, the, the waves really roll in, the, 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 the winds are pretty significant. Um, and I would think to myself, looking at the sea, what are you going to do? What are the oceans going to do? Uh, because, you know, the oceans that roll in, the winds howling, it seems like a living being. Um, Dave, this is virtually spiritual, so I'm saying this for you. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, and <clears throat> so the answer, an answer came to me back, and that is to say, what are you going to do? Because we are in control of things. Because uh, you know, the, the, the control knob on atmospheric CO2, uh, on, on global warming, is atmospheric CO2, and we control that. And so. We control whether the seas will continue to rise. I mean, of course, you know, significant additional warming is already baked into the system, regrettably. So we will we will have uh, some substantial additional sea level rise uh, come what may. But uh, we do control ultimately how high those uh, the sea will rise. And uh, it, it got me to thinking about well, what more then can can I do? Because I, I've had an enormous opportunity to be studying these issues, trying to do uh, a little bit about them. But there is no, at this time, as far as I can see, concerted effort to impose this type of liability on those who are most deserving of it so that you could achieve this significant uh, incentive for them to rapidly phase out emissions take them down a few notches, and at the same time, recover uh, carbon drawdown damages that are necessary to fund the projects that actually could help resolve the problem even after we phase out emissions. And so um, then, uh, today, uh, we go live. I founded a new organization uh, to uh, just for this purpose. Uh, its name is Climate Protection and Restoration Initiative. Um, the uh, the website went live. This is a, I, I captured uh, this just a couple hours ago, and then found that there's a grammatical error. And so, <laughs> but if you go uh, on the website now, it's actually uh, fixed. Um, and we uh, aim through this to tell the truth, to figure out the requisite structures, um, legal and bureaucratic to impose this liability, to have the work undertaken where it makes the most sense. Uh, that is to say there's significant potential uh, in uh, some countries for, for example, reforestation or agricultural improvements and less potential in other places. And also you don't want to, you don't want to start new forests where there otherwise would be significant albedo effect from uh, snow cover. I mean, need to do this in a smart way that reduces global warming rather than enhances it. And and so and, and you want to spend the money where it makes most sense. You want to get the most bang for its buck. So we aim to try to help figure this out, to bring the relevant science in a more understandable way to policymakers at the state, national, and international level, and uh, to um, undertake uh, the necessary uh, legal efforts to impose liability where it most belongs. And our uh, uh, name of the website is cprclimate.org. So thank you very much. It's uh, an honor to be able to address you and happy to entertain any uh, questions. So what did you tell legislators? Oh, right. <laughs> well, one of the 
overarching problems that we have is that there's no price on carbon. And in some ways, the climate crisis is the outgrowth of a traditional externalities problem. Um, and so uh, a state, if it chose to, be, uh, to, to go so far, could impose a price on carbon. Uh, and to avoid uh, significant uh, disruptions for low-income people who are least able to afford higher energy prices, this could be done in a reasonably progressive way by having a fee and dividend plan. This is a plan that has been uh, pressed at the national level by a few groups. And I, in fact, learned that there is legislation that has already gone through. I don't know what it's called here, but your equivalent of legislative council. So it's in the hopper. It's among the mix of, um, of bills that may be, be considered. That's a reach. Would it be production-based or consumption-based carbon tax? It would be uh, production-based. So you would impose it, uh, you know, uh, in, the, in the importation of the fuels. Bad news is we opposed it last year. Ah, you did. Okay. Production See, this is why I'm reticent. To say production ba production-based is um, if you are an emitter, you hide it within the bill. Uh -huh. Let's say you impose it on somebody who produces greenhouse, uh, releases greenhouse gases. So it's an added fee in whatever you buy, but you don't actually see it. Whereas if it's a consumption-based, it means it appears on a on your sales receipt like a tax. You're, you're charged with the amount of emissions that you are consuming. Right. So it's, a, it's an item, and that fits with the um, sustainable development goals of responsible consumption. Well, I don't know what the draft here says. Actually. It's production. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Uh, it wasn't available to for us to, to take a look, but we were just told. So you should know that. Um, on the other hand, I think Chip might take the opposite position, right? No, I like uh, letting the consumer know that they're being taxed for their choices. Good. So uh, another idea that I threw out, this is probably already one that that has been pressed. See, this is the reason why I was reluctant to actually respond to it. I'm not sure what's been tried here. But you know, you have a lot of rental cars here. So, and we've got to phase out fossil fuel yes. cars. So, um, let your tourists uh, bear the brunt initially. Phase out uh, rental fossil fuel cars over a period of, say, eight years or something like that. And the difference between a comparable electric vehicle and a conventional one is, you know, between 50 and 70 percent price. But if spread out by a lot of users, uh, it it will become, you know, almost uh, obscure, um, but could have a significant impact because the fleet turns over every couple of years, and then the rental cars sell those vehicles. In order to reduce shipping costs, they often sell them locally, probably sell them here in uh, Oahu, for example. I hope that worked. We wrote a bill on that last year and had no hearing. Ah, well, we might give it up. Anyhow, just by accident, I promoted one of your bills. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of ideas, and, and I think there's a, lot, there's a lot of talent in this room. There's a lot of smart people um, on this island in the islands, uh, but um, you know, I think, well, what you just said, that's that's quite concerning. Um, when, if, you, if you are a sponsor of legislation, if you put in the work to, uh, your citizens have put in the work to help bring something forward, I think you deserve a hearing and a vote. So the comment, the comment was, uh, we had a bill, but then never, never heard about it, never saw the light of day. So, um, not democracy, but... yeah, that's not right. So you, no, we should try. you, you should, <clears throat> we should, try you should. Uh, I mean, again, I'm saying you should, but you might consider, you know, having a big meeting with leadership. Invite leadership to one of these meetings. You know, you have a Democratic Party here, and this state is fairly strongly uh, Democrat. Yeah. 
Um, and so, you know, Democrats should act in a democratic way. You know, it's actually in our 2018 state platform. Mm. Uh, it's really? in there. And the legislators are supposed to, if they're Democrats, Bye, you are if yeah. they're yeah. Democrats. <laughs> what do you mean? They're, they aren't Democrats. You, I, I, I was going to have a meeting with the Republican who apparently is uh, better than any of the Democrats. The first thing yeah. that happened to the Democratic Party in this state was the collapse of the Republicans. Hmm. Well, and all the, all the conservatives in the legislature migrated to the Democratic Party. Well, the Republicans you, run as Democrats. No, I, mean, I don't. I don't know what's. I don't. You know. Again, I don't quite know what the hell is going on here. But you, know, you, you need to. You need to hold your your Democrats. Um, we try that. Accountable. Look, you. You all live. You know, I'm a visitor. You all live in paradise, and you know if we can't say paradise, what what can we say, right? I mean, this is this is a place where. You need to exercise leadership, uh, and if you exercise this type of leadership, you know, I mean, really, you can't save Hawaii unless you you save Vanuatu. Can't save Vanuatu unless you save the Solomon Islands. Can't save the Solomon Islands unless you save Bangladesh, Bangladesh or RMI. And you can't save the the Republic of the Marshall Islands or the Maldives without saving New York City. So in some sense, we, that is, all coastal areas, we're, we're in this together. And, and, and we're, we're, we're seeking someone to really stand up. And in fact, that's the reason that Stuart knows that I've been going over to COP 23 and 24 and 25. Yeah, well, you know, Providing the opportunity for uh, nations to understand how they can st stand up, but states can stand up as well. The states, under our federal system, are sovereigns who are responsible, including, by the way, having the principal responsibility under the Clean Air Act for air resources. So, anyhow, I didn't want to be too soapboxy about what you should do in Hawaii, but. That's 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 what else, what else besides a fee and dividend? Well, I mean, we need to phase out. We need to electrify um, our societies. We need to electrify transportation. We need to phase out uh, fossil fuel. Um, agricultural systems need to be reformed. Uh, there, you know, there needs to be uh, less inputs of fossil fuel. I mean, the whole nine yards. And why are you asking me? You wrote the book on it. <laughs> I wanted to hear what you had to say. Um, you know, we need to we need to get busy so that we can do everything we can to put pressure on to phase out fossil fuel emissions and figure out how we can draw down excess atmospheric CO two. Uh, and that requires policy changes, and that requires uh, innovative litigation and engagement by everyone. By the way. You know, everyone, so, uh, Chip's an expert, you know, in climate science here, so are several other people, including Don. But climate science is for everyone. Everyone needs to understand the basics, and everyone can, and everyone can understand the basics. Even lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Dan, Dan, I have a question. Oh. Oh, so someone calling on the line. Okay, someone's calling on the Yes. This is uh, Brody Lockhart. I'm a founder of 350 Hawaiian. Hi. Hey. My name's Brody. Hi, Brody. Hey, how are you guys? Thanks, uh, for Thanks for your work. Thanks for your work. What are your thoughts on fears that gas up from carbon majors will retaliate against suits with price hikes or in Hawaii by stopping shipments? That they will retaliate by undercutting their own profits by stopping shipments. Well, that's um, my response. I wonder what you're saying. Yeah, I, you know, 
Might not be. I don't know. Let them try. Not a bad idea, actually. Let them try. Um, I mean, I, I, I think that it would, my thought is that it would backfire, Brody. In what way? Because it would, they would incur the enmity of the populace. That's where we're headed. I think they already have that. Not sufficiently. Uh, no, not sufficiently. I mean, people are annoyed, but people are not yet enraged. There's reason to be enraged, but people are not yet enraged. So, okay, all the way. Thank you, Brody. All the way in the back. Thank you. Yeah, you had an you to louder, louder. Yeah. You had an opportunity to look at the uh, Green New Deal bill that's being introduced into the California legislature last week. No, I haven't looked at that yet. Is it a good one? Uh, it appears to be. I'm just wondering uh -huh. if, if we might replicate that and use it as a model. Uh -huh. right. Yeah. The question was have I looked at the Green New Deal um, legislation that was introduced into the California legislature? <coughs> My answer is uh, that I have uh, not looked at that yet. Uh, <clears throat> by the way, um, all legislation that is introduced in the California legislature is available um, online, so people can go have a look at that. Do you know the author? I'm sorry. No. Okay, well, that can be found out pretty quickly. Yes, Dave? Uh, just do, uh, uh, what can I say, uh, commercial here. That uh, one of the ways that we can deal with uh, our inertia Democratic representatives is to, for progressives to run for office. So I want to make that announcement. We need to get as many progressives to run for office as possible. The other thing we do is register voters. We have 7 million kids walking across the graduation stage across the United States, and they're going to be brought into the voting pool. And they are very concerned about climate change. So registering voters and 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 uh, inviting other progressives to run for office. So we got a couple in this last time, uh, Amy Crusoe and uh, Tina Wildberger, and, and many on the uh, in, on, in Maui on their county council. But we need to get more legis more uh, progressive legislators. They're there alone, and so uh, you all know people, you know teachers. Anties, whatever, and if you know some smart people, uh, we need to have them on. So I, that's one of the things we could do here to put pressure on these dinos that are just <coughs> not moving. Right. So, yeah. So that's for the for those who are uh, online, the comment was that we need to get busy politically, uh, running progressive uh, people for the legislature, registering people to vote. People need to register each time they move. For example. Um, so they're not locked out of the uh, of voting. Yes, Stuart. Stuart with Mike. Sure. This is a comment, not a, a question per se, but um, unfortunately, your approach has to take the um, slow advance of the ocean rise as the uh, the factor that's generating your the liability, the the, the, the lawsuit. But from <coughs> messaging about climate change for the last dozen years. To me, the, the 2100 number is kiss of death. I would say many of you who message about climate change avoid statistics that include the number 2100 because they immediately make people go to sleep. It's not right. our problem. Too far in the future. It's too far in the future. Um, even 2050 is too, too far in the future. So cognitive, this is just cognitive. If somebody wants to refer to something, yeah, you don't. You can say the words, but don't bring it up because. Um, and the other thing is that ocean rise is not what we have to worry about most, as far as I'm concerned. Having analyzed the anomaly of uh, ill effects, it's it's scarcity of food because they've already experienced in, in Europe uh, 20 to 40 percent crop reduction last year, so they know that their crop their supplies are, are vulnerable. And my information is that that Trump administration had uh, released this year a Department of Agriculture document, uh, which is a 10-year uh, uh, prediction, uh, which was total fabrication, and they released it on the day after Thanksgiving so that it would get buried, wouldn't get reported. Um, but apparently there is severe concern for the food supply in the United States within the next few years. 
because of the climate change. So that's a, a strong one to get people uh, concerned about. Yeah, but that's also augmented by the fact that much of our problem is done by immigrants. Or people the big ones here are hurricanes, rain bombs, and fire. Right. Right. And how about that? You know, Mats and stops sailing. Yeah. We're always we're always yeah. confronted with it. Max and stops sailing, we've got four days supply of food. I mean, I, I think these are all great points, and I appreciate that. Um, but the, the fact is that significant numbers of cities uh, around the world are on the coastlines, and we are confronting uh, the unlivability of many of these cities, including many of our great cities <clears throat> and cultures. And um, you know, it's, it's a big question: where are people going to go? How are, how are we going to uh, manage in the event that our major metropolitan areas are um, uh, inundated? So, um, so I, I appreciate the point, and and, uh, and I agree that fires and catastrophes like this. Yes, sir. Um, I just wanted to say I left here in Michigan. Um, I had a reaction to it that I wonder if you would want to address your website in case other people have the same thought, and that was. Um, Wonder what the disincentive would be for people working in the fossil fuel industry right now to just go for broke and pay themselves as much as possible and not worry about what the future might really be because they wouldn't individually necessarily be liable for that. I'm sorry, that's a good that, so the question was could. Um, these fossil fuel companies, or the uh, the titans who run them, uh, give themselves some substantial raise, raises, so as to limit the amount of um, you know resources they have that would be vulnerable to some of these lawsuits. Um, that wasn't what I meant. No. What, oh. what I meant is not like feel like okay, well let's go bankrupt, right? Mm -hmm. Let's let's not worry about the future liability of people who are going to be Let's aim to produce as much as we can, pay ourselves as much as we can, and go bankrupt. We have, a, we have a fiduciary responsibility, and, and there's a lot of really big, powerful players who own stocks in these companies. And I really doubt that a lot of these hedge funds, et cetera, would let that happen. So, so anyways, that, that, that was a reaction I had. Yeah. And so yeah. you might want to explain that when to people who read that and perhaps. Yeah, it's a good point. Well, I think that's a good point in response. Yes. John. Uh, I think one of the problems is that's ah, okay. I'll try to talk loud. They can't. Um, they can't hear you. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. I, I think one of the problems that, that, that we, we have is is that scientists tend to be real careful about what we say, and we try to make sure that we can back stuff up. And the climate deniers uh, are under no compulsion to do that. I mean, they'll make the wildest claims, and and uh, and then it's really hard to it's really hard to combat that. Dan, you were real careful about about sea level rise, and, and you said there was about a Five and 100, 100 chance that, that, the, that you would see those, those sort of numbers, but 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 that statement is really sensitive uh, to a lot of assumptions about um, sort of catastrophic events that might happen, and people don't realize that. And I think maybe we ought to we ought to focus on the fact that if we have some some uh, uh, runaway uh, events uh, like the permafrost melting, etc., or, or the cloud that's coming up, that uh, that as a matter of fact, those numbers are. Are just are just a joke, and, and, and you'll, you'll actually see a lot of that stuff a lot earlier. Um, and the other thing is, there are things like the Southern Ocean becoming uh, basically more likely to uh, to, to dissolve uh, shells than, than form shells in about 15 years. I mean, that, that's something that I think people can relate to. Yeah, and on that first point, um, uh, Jim Hansen has a significant uh, paper which. Uh, I, uh, I'll refer to on the, on the website soon on um, ice melt and sea level rise, uh, showing that uh, there is a significant chance of um, massive disintegration of the West Antarctic uh, ice sheet, and uh, potentially within uh, 
on the order of five decades. So it is, uh, so it's true. The, <clears throat> the tool that I used here was Climate Centrals, and it does not account for that potential of disintegration of major ice sheets, um, you know, on order of uh, five to ten decades. Uh, and uh, yeah, you know, it, it's tough because you know when scientists start to quantify risks and they start putting um, you know, the likelihood of these, and people tend to discount uh, small likelihoods. But a small likelihood of a catastrophic event is something that we uh, we need to attend to. And that's the that's the whole point of insurance, for example. But we have not built that. Um, we have we, we have not acted in that same sort of way with respect to our energy policy. Yes, right here. Yeah, would you describe a little bit the, the feedback loops and the acceleration that we're seeing now? Can you kind of put that in perspective? Because most of the, as I understand it, most of the predictions that have been made have been sort of overrun by reality. Each time they come up with a new report, it's like the worst case scenario from the last time. So maybe if you can kind of describe for people, because I think this is maybe a way to get into their minds a little bit more. Okay, the question is about feedback loops, and also, um, could I describe the fact that uh, we, uh, we're realizing impacts uh, that were previously regarded at, at, the, uh, at the outer edge of likelihood? Um, and I think you know that that's largely true. Although I do not think that we are yet experiencing uh, major feedbacks yet from permafrost. And if that gets cooking, then um, then that will not be so fine. Uh, the major international scientific reports through the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, you know, they cut off the literature review on which they base each five-year review a couple of years before publication. So by the time these authoritative reports are available, um, of necessity, it's just the way it works, I mean, uh, they are you know, behind by a couple of years. So that in part uh, accounts for it. And also, as, uh, <clears throat> as Hansen has written, there's a, there's, a, there's a level of reticence among scientists to um, you know, always be credible, uh, not, not to be out there uh, too far. I mean, Hanson, the, the guy that I've been doing a lot of work with, he doesn't really care. He's <coughs> his way out there. But the problem is he keeps on getting proven right, <coughs> regrettably. He'd like to be proven wrong. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a difficult situation. And as I say, we... We are, we are not undertaking planning on the basis of uh, what is the what is the extremes, and so I think you're right. We need to be uh, attending to the to, uh, the problems of, um, of uh, enhanced feedbacks. Well, the point of that, of course, similar to what Don was saying, is that scientists may be limited in what they can say, what they feel comfortable saying, but the rest of us may not be. You know, the rest of us may be more on the side of the kind of things that climate deniers do, but within a more reasonable framework to say that things are getting a lot worse a lot faster. And that, right. as you say, the catastrophic events are going to get up before we ever get there. Right. Right. I mean, I guess, so the, the, the comment was maybe we also should be willing to um, be at the tail end of plausibility. I, I myself feel like the what what is known for what is reasonably known is scary enough. And um, you know, I guess as a lawyer, I think about you know what I what I want to present to a judge and want to retain credibility, and so I you know I try to I try to hew close to um, hew close to the science and. Not speculate too much. I mean, there's, you know, there's, there's been a lot of speculation that uh, the permafrost is—I don't know what you call it—but like in free fall now. But I don't think that the evidence is in there. So I don't. You know, uh, although there was a significant report 
uh, on the Arctic uh, recently uh, uh, has you know, this substantial reason for concern there. But in any event, um, in my, my, own, my own view is that what is known for reasonable certainty is, is, uh, is scary enough. Um, and I, but I do worry, though, Stuart, that uh, I might make people's gla eyes glaze over if I, if, I, uh, if I insist on thinking about or talking about what's going to happen 80 years from now. But I, <clears throat> I think that we should be concerned about what's going to be happening in 180 years from now as well. So, anyway, Chip, what, what, what's the answer? <laughs> So actually, a, a paper just came out identifying nine planetary systems that are thought to have already begun the tip of the point where they're changing to uh, unstoppability. Uh, one of them is the Amazon rainforest, and there's been a lot of news there. But in addition to the burning of the Amazon rainforest in order to largely grow the corn that will feed the cattle, uh, there's been drought. That we eat. What's that? So that we eat. Right, that's what I mean. When you grow cattle, you eat it. Uh, so that's based on, on the beef agriculture. There's also drought that's hitting the Amazon rainforest. We also have Arctic sea ice, which is in uh, free fall. It's between 40 and 70 percent less than what its natural cover would be in the summertime. That's the Earth's refrigerator. It reflects sunlight rather than absorbs it. Um, Atlantic circulation, which Jim Hansen's one of my favorite papers in 2016 spoke to the freshwater coming off of Greenland, which slows down the currents, the Gulf Stream, which heads to the north. Uh, as that slows down, there's less heat taken out of the tropics and out of the southern Atlantic. Hence, you get super uh, tropical cyclones and you get heat building up along uh, the South Atlantic and therefore you get accelerated warming in Antarctica. Now, the boreal forests, the great uh, pine forests of the north, are teetering on the edge of being carbon releasing systems rather than carbon sequestering systems because of droughts and, and uh, wildfire. The coral reefs are uh, expected to experience annual bleaching uh, before mid century. Um, the Greenland ice sheet uh, has seen a fourfold increase in the rate of melting in the last decade. Uh, the permafrost we've talked about, but um, you know there, there's the potential for the rapid release of methane, and we see in the Siberian permafrost area giant uh, caverns that have formed because the melting permafrost has allowed the soil and mud to slide. Uh, these things are enormous. Um, the West Antarctic ice sheet is already declared in a state of irreversible retreat and appears to be accelerating. And the Wilkes Basin in East Antarctica uh, appears to be uh, accelerating its melting. So these are nine major systems uh, that, that control uh, the release of greenhouse gases and uh, the reflectivity of the planet, which is a cooling system that all appear to be uh, collapsing with only 1.1 degrees C. Uh, some of the first IPCC reports suggested this wouldn't happen until four or five degrees C. So that's the uh, occurrence is happening much faster than we thought they would. Thank you. Is that a, a, a single? Uh, you know, it's a paper came out in Nature. If you Google uh, climate tipping points, Nature magazine. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That was uh, last month. 2019, I think. 2019. Uh, I think I saw that article. That, uh, within two months. You uh, you have a uh, draft legislation to declare climate emergency in Hawaii. But, yeah. I, I think a climate emergency is something the governor does, and it's a short term thing. It's like they can declare it for, what, three months? Right. But they, they also have a uh, homeless crisis, and they just you know we're really fighting. So we're still, we still, we still we have a plan. We have but, a no, but this is a this is a as I understand it, this is not for the governor. <coughs> this is a legislative right. resolution. Right. So right there, the whole legislative thing is going to do a reading. Right. Well, okay. Um. <clears throat> now, um, you will hear at the legislature because they have heard 
that if you try something too far reaching, that uh, this is a legal point, uh, that that will uh, interfere uh, and, and be vulnerable to challenge under the Interstate Commerce Clause or the, the so-called Dormant Commerce, Commerce Clause. But there's an exception in the case law for where there is a, where the legislation is trying to uh, address a matter of uh, public health and safety. So what I'm suggesting is that your climate emergency legislation is not merely precatory. It could have some actual effect because you would thereby be having the legislature establish the necessary legal predicates for your more far-reaching legislation that could have some impact uh, on uh, you know, economic um, interests that are beyond Hawaii. And so uh, you should think about uh, laying that groundwork. That's not enough that you have this you know, freestanding resolution. Uh, in all your legislation, you should uh, you should have findings, and um, uh, you know uh, you, you should have legislative findings in all the legislation, and it should actually be a, a matter of uh, testimony before uh, your substantive committees um, that this is being addressed, that, that this is this is being done to address a public health and safety. Um, emergency uh, in Hawaii, yeah. and, and that will help later on to sustain the legislation from predictable uh, legal attack. Okay. Yes. So one of the questions that I, um, you, know, I you know, I understand like you know this whole like syntax type approach basically, right? You know, but the reality is is that when we tax carbon or we tax energy or producers, right? And, you know, as, as I said earlier, basically it comes out of the consumer anyways. So I think one of the biggest questions that I never really see get addressed, and maybe you have some examples of what's been a good examples that have worked well, is how do you put that tax back into the community to actually provide reparations, right? To actually restore it. Because I think a lot of people hear of the tax, they think of an expense, and I think you know, you know, across the United States, you know, a lot of people don't trust in the government, the money goes to their general fund, and then where does it go right in people's pockets and yeah. not where it needs to go? So what are the answers to that as far as the next step? Like I think like this climate resolution, right? It's like it's the first step, but if we don't have the next step, no one's prepared, I think, to take the first step. Right. Well, I think the proposal that's been worked out by a number of people uh, is to have a fee and dividend so that the money gets immediately refunded on a per capita basis to residents. Um, now, since persons who are most wealthy and so most capable of affording um, higher energy or gas or whatever prices, uh, they, their, their bills would increase, um, perhaps disproportionately, uh, higher than the average, but they're most able to pay for it. You'd actually um, get a check in the mail. Right, you get a check in the mail, similar to what happens in Alaska, um, and it's a very popular program. So, <clears throat> so that, that, that's, that's the idea. No. Yes. Okay, well, I'm getting text questions here. I don't know why it's coming to me this way, but... Text. Text, yeah. Okay. There was a clarification. It's Rob Bonda and nine assembly uh, Democrats that introduced the California Green New Deal on January 6th. So that's just for clarification. And I have a question from Lana Olson, who is our Environmental Caucus Chair. She asks, and I'm not sure if you could answer this, but her question is, other than voting out legislators, is there another way to hold them accountable for not enacting legislation that supports legislative goals that have been voted for by citizens? Um, <laughs> the question was, other than voting them out, is there another way of holding legislators accountable for their actions in this area? We have to all show up. Yeah. Uh, show up to what? To the, to the legislature, to testify, to the state capitol. We have to show up on the streets. We have to show up. <laughs> so public pressure, um, uh, holding people accountable publicly, um, I guess that sort of thing uh, can be done. Uh, 
uh, and can be done very effectively. You know, even writing to legislators uh, sometimes can be effective because so few people do. So since so few people do, when a letter comes in, uh, I, I, I say this as a person who used to work for a, a moderate uh, legislator, and, and uh, they pay attention to, especially to constituents' letters. So yeah, all facets of democracy um, are in order here, uh, holding people accountable, publicizing voting records, uh, publicizing um, records of Bearing legislation, we do it all behind closed doors. You, know. <laughs> you can't publicize behind closed doors. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, that's what you're saying. Yes. Yeah. Make that known. Is that well known? I doubt it. Yeah. It, it is. is. Well, everybody votes. Everybody votes yes or yes with reservations in committee. It all goes behind closed doors. Leadership decides. It comes out. The leadership decides yeah. whether it comes out. It gets buried. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean. You know, you, you can't totally, you probably don't want to totally, well, it has to have to think through what is it that you want? You know, what reforms do you want here? And then you push for them. Um, you, there, there is something to be said for the ability of, of legislative leadership to be able to make choices and to think about priorities. Um, uh, people need to be strategic. But on the other hand, there should be accountability and there should be explanation. So um, don't you know? Don't take don't take this is the way it always is. Yeah. Well, we another question. Yeah, I, I received another text from Matt Geyer. Would you recommend those who are able to go to school now with the goal of becoming an environmental lawyer? What I recommend. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, I wouldn't say it's a growth industry, but um, you know, it's kind of hard to make your way. And, uh, yeah. if you like, if you like fighting against big interests, uh, and uh, you know, you like to be, you know, have one or two people on your side, and that is to say, in, in, in conference rooms or in. Uh, in, in in court, you know, we like to go against the big guys and the big gals, and that's a good thing to do. But only about one percent of lawyers argue in court, right? I, I guess so. Yeah. I, yeah, that's true. And and there's that's right. And there's many other things that one can do with a law degree, uh, even on the side of the angels, than go to court. Going to, going to court's not for everyone because, you know, you. Judges are grumpy. Uh, <laughs> you're having to deal with sleaze balls on the other side. I mean, you know, yeah. sometimes there's respect. Yes. University of Hawaii has one of the nation's best environmental law yes. programs. Would you please tell that for the first yes. 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 University of Hawaii has one of the uh, nation's best uh, environmental law program. Uh, I uh, I know a, a, a few of them. They're top notch. And there is a lot of uh, there's, a, there's a lot of cases to be brought, and there's a lot of work to be done uh, to restore our um, environment. And you know, of course, uh, the climate system is only one facet of it. We're in a, 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 a we're in a historically uh, very important uh, period of um, rapid de deterioration of the environment. And Loss of species uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, climate change is an overlay um, over uh, a number of other uh, threats, and so a lot of work needs to be done to protect and restore habitat, uh, to uh, you know pr uh, prevent despoil despoilation and pollution even uh, beyond um, uh, chemicals that are inducing uh, rapid climate change. Do you have my reading glasses? Yeah, yeah. No, no, that's no, okay. <laughs> Last name is Geyer. Hey, Geyer. Oh, no, this is Phaeton. Oh, Phaeton. Yes. From Phaeton. Is this Phaeton? 
Yes, that's her question. All right, Phaeton asks, what will our Hawaii climate mitigation lawsuit look like? Timeline, argument, limited to sea level rise from multiple facets, etc. Also, are there any legal actions that you know of against the IPCC and EPA to address the carbon ne neutral accounting of biogenic emissions and the worldwide push from coal to biomass waste energy? Um, all right, so I, I can't, uh, I haven't seen the, your complaint, uh, but, uh, and it's not Hawaii, it's it's Maui and you know, Oahu, so it's but the the cases are going to be by the counties, not by the state. Um, and <clears throat> so, whether it will be limited to sea level rise or most, multiple facets, uh, I'm not. I'm just not sure because I haven't read the complaint. <clears throat> um, but I believe that the complaint is likely to be filed soon, and so you will soon know that, and we will um, we will analyze it on our on our new website. Uh, People can go there. Oh, incidentally, can you pass around the yeah those half pages? If you're interested at all in um, what we're doing, our take on things, then please fill out uh, this, and we can we can get back to you. So, are there any other legal actions that you know of against the IPCC? I don't know of any against the IPCC, uh, and I don't want to bring those. Um, any against EPA, yes. Hundreds of cases are against EPA. But to address the carbon neutral accounting of biogenic emissions and the worldwide push from coal to biomass waste energy, I don't know of. Wait a second, I do know. I have a case. <laughs> um, I have a case against Trump and. Uh, and uh, California Governor Gavin Newsom uh, for their biomass effort. This is not called a biomass, but they are. There was a huge fire called the Rim Fire uh, on the border of Yosemite, the largest fire in, in Sierra Nevada history, uh, induced for a number of reasons. Uh, and so, <clears throat> but the, the forests are regenerating naturally. But through uh, a diversion of funds that are supposed to be for um, for disaster-related recovery, uh, they are proposing to cut down the trees that are actually regenerating, send them to a biomass facility. Uh, and so we have uh, sued under the National Environmental Policy Act uh, on that ground. But in terms of... Uh, Oh, I lost it here. In terms of cases challenging coal to biomass, um, that I think she's referring to our case. Ah, on the big island. okay. Yeah. Well, on the Big Island, uh, there is uh, a case um, that you can address if you, if you would like that deals with uh, attempting to stop the uh, raising of a number of uh, uh, privately held uh, eucalyptus. Uh, trees and uh, to generate uh, biomass uh, from that and that uh, are you are you back before the PUC or is that yes, yes. That's at the PUC. right so that went up to the Hawaii Supreme Court um, and um, uh, and that is at the PUC right now so that's an important case any others Okay, well, thank you very much. It's been a wonderful evening. I really appreciate it. Okay, you had mentioned that it's going to take all, everyone, all the countries to really make a difference here. How, how do you propose to do that? I mean, that's a very extensive order. <laughs> Just wondering how, how can we do this step at a time? Well, we all have to do what we can. We all have to take the steps that we have within our power. Um, but once a nation or a state stands up and wins some of these cases, for example, if you're talking about litigation, um, that can spread. Um, and uh, once a uh, once some state starts to get serious about limiting 
emissions within its jurisdiction, then that can spread. So, you know, I don't have any particularly excellent answer there. All I can say is that um, if we act on our knowledge, you know, with with um, with with strength and conviction, you know, then as Kant said, the maximum of our action can be a universal law of nature, and we can turn things around. All right. Thank you. Thank you.